Why is the collapse of Greensill dominating headlines from here to London? And why is the Wyala Steelworks under threat from it? For years, founder Lex Greensill has been fated as a financial wunderkind, the boy from Bundaberg receiving global awards and even being made a commander of the British Empire. For what? It's a global fintech powerhouse that specialises in working capital finance. The company has now provided funding of over $163 billion during 2020 on behalf of more than 10 million customers in 175 countries. It's a remarkable story. It's supply chain finance, something that's been around since, well, the beginning of trade. Greensill just made it sound much more cutting edge than it really is. But what's brought Greensill unstuck is not the financing of small business payments, but some huge loans he's made to big businesses, calling it trade finance. Because it's not, it's unsecured credit. And one of those big businesses is the owner of the Wyala Steelworks, metals magnate Sanjeev Gupta. His business owns Greensill $6.5 billion, which it doesn't have. And Greensill's major funder, Credit Suisse, essentially pulled the pin, leaving Greensill to file for bankruptcy. Regulators in Germany, the UK and Australia are now pouring over Greensill. South Australia's Small Business Commissioner John Chapman is following the situation in Wyala closely. John Chapman, you've been in contact with GFG today. Uh, have they given you enough assurances that the company is a going concern? My questions haven't revolved around that. It, it was more, how is the business going? And the business is going extremely well in terms of the steelworks at Wyala and indeed the iron ore mine. There's a lot of iron ore going out to China. The iron ore prices are good. But so it's positive. GFG executives are concentrating at the moment on making sure people get paid. It's one of my priorities, and I've written to GFG to set that out that the current terms need to be honoured and that the small businesses cannot be used to finance uh, other problems. How much money uh, does GFG sort of owe at any one time through invoices? In terms of the business, there's something like 600 South Australian and Wyala-based businesses that do business with GFG, uh, both on the mining side and the steelworks side. And at any, any one time, there's tens of millions of dollars owing. The terms are generally 62-day payment terms. I've spoken to Mr Gupta about that because I don't like 62-day terms. They should be 30 days or less. It's something I and my interstate colleagues and indeed national uh, small business and family enterprise, Kate Carnell, have been on about in terms of big business, paying accounts when they fall due rather than using the small businesses as banks. So there are tens of millions outstanding at any one time. But importantly, this month, there have been very few issues that I'm aware of in terms of the payments not being made. Generally, they're made early in the month and I haven't had uh, any complaints about that at this stage. Over the last couple of months there have been a few reports that GFG has been late in paying invoices. Were they just spot problems with a couple of different companies or is it systemic? We've had issues over the last two to three years with GFG but in the last 12 months the payments have improved considerably and substantially and they are generally on time. There are occasional blips from time to time and I'm talking one to maybe five as, as a, a normal case per month where that payment hasn't been made. I make a phone call or send an email and it's usually resolved if the amount's owing uh, that day. You've said that you've spoken today to uh, one particular business that uh, has invoices outstanding with GFG. Um, they insure against uh, or have insurance to uh, cover whether GFG pays them or not, um, that insurance has been pulled. Could you explain that? Yes, the business got in contact with me today just to let, the, let me know that the insurance that they have to make sure they do get paid by GFG uh, has been cancelled as of today. Now, that business will need to think about how it goes forward in terms of its outstandings, um, but hopefully we'll find a positive way with GFG and indeed that business. But it shows the ripple effect of what happens when international events involving finance and Greensill, some of the ripple effects that has on the people on the ground in Wyala.
My understanding is that there aren't any uh, contractors to GFG or suppliers to GFG who directly use Green Seal. It was just GFG itself who was using Green Seal for financing. Is that your understanding? That's my understanding. GFG proposed a couple of years ago to use the Green Seal model of supply chain finance, but for whatever reason, they couldn't make it work. And, that's, and that was their words in terms of the supply chain finance. It just didn't work for, for Wyala. And as a result, uh, all the information I have is that is not an issue here in South Australia. I believe it could be an issue uh, with some other companies nationally and indeed internationally, but at the moment, South Australia, we have no evidence of it. So what will you be keeping an eye on now as this unfolds? Uh, there are reports that GFG has put up some of its Australian assets as collateral to Greensill for some of the loans that it took out. Uh, what will you be keeping an eye on? I'll be keeping an eye on everything I can to do with GFG. The Wyala Steelworks and the mine are a very important part of the economy of our state and the small businesses that supply to them, that's my remit as Small Business Commissioner. So I'll be working right through trying to actually understand what's going on, what's happening. I'm heading up to Wyala at this stage uh, on Friday, earlier if necessary, to make sure that the businesses are aware of what's going on and I can get direct feedback from them. John Chapman, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Elise. Greensill's sales pitch was that it made finance fairer. But is it really fairer if, in order to be paid on time, a small business has to accept a reduced payment? Greensill's collapse has again sparked debate about payment times. Small business ombudsman Kate Carnell, on her last day in the role, suggests legislation is probably the only way to shift the dial. Kate Carnell, what does this story that we've seen with Greensill highlight for you about the issue of small businesses, payment times, etc. Look, what it really says is that big businesses should pay small businesses and maybe all businesses on time, which is 30 days or less, and not go to third parties to try to improve that maybe their cash flow and liquidity at the expense of small businesses, which is fundamentally what happens here. Small businesses have to give a discount to be paid uh, on time or quicker than the big business is willing to pay them. So they pick up the tab. What are those payment times stretching out to now? Oh, we're seeing uh, 45, 60, even 90, 90 days, um, which is really difficult for small businesses because they've been through COVID too and they're really, really struggling. I think everyone would accept that small businesses have really uh, picked, have really had the worst uh, problems through through COVID. Many of them have been closed. Uh, they simply haven't had the capacity um, to weather the storm as well as really big businesses. So slow payment times now um, might be the difference for some business between businesses between survival and uh, hopefully, well, hopefully not, but uh, but closure. Uh is it time for legislation on this issue? I mean, the Business Council has has said to their members, you know, try and try and keep it to 30 days. But for small businesses, there's no real definition, a single definition for what a small business is. Um, is it time that we actually just see legislation to actually force force this? Look, my office has said legislation is. Uh, is the best way to go. Now, the government has passed legislation and put in place the Payment Times Transparency Register, whether reporting a bit of transparency will make them pay quicker. The legislation on its own, though, just requires them to report, yeah. not pay in a reasonable time frame. Kate Carnell, uh, this is your second last day in your role as the Ombudsman with the Small Business and Family Enterprise Office. Uh, you've been there for several years now. I'm sure there's many small business owners and family business owners who'd like to thank you for the work that you've done on the many issues that you have picked up. Is there any outstanding business, though, that you would really like the next Ombudsman to pick up and run with? Uh, for small businesses to survive, they've got to be able to get um, access to finance, they've got to be able to get the insurance products they they need and they've got to be able to be paid on time. I don't think that's a lot to ask for the engine room of our economy 
And that's what small businesses are. That's where jobs are going to come from. Kate Carnell, thank you very much for your time today and for your work with the office. Thanks, Elise.